Hi, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. And uh, it's been more crazy weather. And, you know, I just really think this global warming thing is much worse than Al Gore and, and uh, Obama are telling us. But there's the word kragma. And they take the, they don't tell you the correct definition of it. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. And there's the Greek-English lexicon with the word karagma, which means the impress on the coin, or number two, stamp money coin. So it's the money of the beast, not the mark of the beast. It's not an RFD chip or anything like that. It's um, money, you know, in order to buy or sell, it's the mark of the beast. The, the beast is... Uh, that train those kids are riding up from Honduras. Ah, oh, those poor kids, but we've got poor kids in Chicago and everywhere else, you know, and uh, so they've got bad gangs down there, and, you know, why don't we send our army down there instead of having them in Afghanistan or something? I guess they need to... Well, the Taliban took the heroin out of Afghanistan, and then... When we came back in there, we took the, made them biggest heroin ever up there, and they poisoned these children with it, and these people in the ghettos, and a stupefier. It's a really bad drug, and, you know, our army is there, and, and, the, and the heroin is there, and the, the Taliban tried to stop this horrible stuff. So, I mean, who's worse? It's like, who's worse in Iraq? Is it... Um, Saddam Hussein or or the present situation, you know, Saddam allegedly gassed these people that lived up in the mountains because they wanted to break away and now they have some kind of autonomous zone up there. But um, anyway, the, the you know, this well, I had a map, I don't know if I cut it out, it was all about that. Oh yeah, here it is. It shows where the Kurds live. And uh, I thought it was kinda interesting. You know, after World War One they cut they cut this all up and you know that's part of the reason they had world war one was to cut all these countries up w with the oil and and so these kurdish people they could really have a nice state all the way up and around here but even the united states doesn't want that to happen they've got their own oil up around here and some of these places so you know it's like are they better off there's so many refugees up in the uh, from Iraq, you know, we've America has so much bad karma from the stupid wars, like in Vietnam. A lot of people think that the Vietnam War was fought to get the Golden Triangle where all the heroin was growing and uh, keep that going. In fact, I think the CIA was involved in, under all these drugs, you know, the what is it, the French Connection, and then. Um, there, there was a book somebody wrote, The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, all about um, how our CIA and they were the Contras, remember them down in South America, went down in Nicaragua, and, and they were um, stirring up trouble down there. And America's funded these dictators down there. There's a guy named Smedley Butler uh, who wrote a book about how he was a soldier for for the big companies back then, and and uh, I was just about to say Monsanto, but uh, the, you know this Access Tucson, they've they've got some pretty good shows now. They're starting to kind of team up with KUAT. Like last night, they had this one show. It was all about Monsanto. It was like I think nineteen. It was about ten, ten years old, and um, they were just starting this genetic grains and things and. This, some of these genetic grains fell onto this farmer's land, and then Monsanto comes along and says, oh, look, you, you're planting our crop, our genetically identifiable crop is on your property, you know, and so they ended up suing him and trying to extort money from him and stuff, and, you know, he had a huge farm, so he had a lot of money, and they destroyed his seeds, you know, you can't, so that you have to buy your seeds from Monsanto, or they're trying to, that's another problem is, you know, there's just so many problems because we're not living in tune with nature. We're like gone totally disrespectful of the planet with all this concrete. You know, concrete is a, cement is a big polluter. I don't exactly know why, but it is. 
And so we build these freeways, and a lot of the freeways aren't made of cement, they're made of like asphalt, and, and that's all this petroleum stuff. And so, you know, we've been polluting the planet with all this smoke and, and carbon dioxide from burning trees. They're burning trees in Indonesia to put, put up palm trees so they can grow palm oil there, and I, they make Ben and Jerry's ice cream out of this kind of material which is contributing to global material, global warming because um, these palm trees don't um, absorb as much carbon from the atmosphere as a um, natural rainforest would with like peat moss and all this stuff that can just suck up all the carbon and, and keep it down under the ground instead of in the air and and like you know this crazy weather where some places it just like deluges of rain and they showed a picture of some baseball field i don't remember where it was was all full of water and it came down so fast and and hard it just flooded the whole baseball field so you know they they had to postpone the game it's going to be really muddy they won't be able to run on that field for quite a while and i don't remember what city that was in but it was just in the internet today so we got these kids that are coming up on this beast train from uh, like Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador. And I don't think any of them are coming from Nicaragua. But um, uh, that's what they're all doing is coming up here. And you can't blame them, you know. And we've got a different law than, than, Mex than with them than we do with Mexico. Like if the Mexican kids come up here, we just turn them around and kick them back there. And, um, but since we were so concerned about um, trafficking, you know, and uh, prostitution, that we, child prostitution, that well, that's why this law was passed. And um, so these people wouldn't traffic in young girls. That's the whole reason that's, that, that we're allowing these children in right now. So they're not really, you know, it wasn't the intention to allow anybody to come here and have refugee status. It was more of a thing to keep out these kind of people. And it's just, you know, these legislators, when they pass these laws, they don't really know what they're doing. And this is kind of like shows you sometimes that the law can uh, backfire on you, and then they're trying to change it real quick. And and it's kind of ridiculous, these laws we have, that, um, I mean, the judge should just say, hey, you know, we just heard from the legislator that the intention of this was and it's something anyway, it's crazy, I'm just going on, but they, um, tuberculosis, they're, it's like, um, I don't know how really bad it is, I, I cut this out for some reason and underlined this, but uh, a lot of these children that are coming up here have um, tuberculosis, and um, so they all, you know, it's just like, um, I can't understand, you know, the whole thing is just so tragic. And with this global warming coming along, it's going to really <clears throat> be crazy. It just makes me so worried because, like, they could any moment have this belch of methane come up. And this methane is much more powerful than carbon dioxide. And, like, it, if it melted, well, it is melting the whole... Arctic Ocean, the ice up there is almost all gone. They've got this video, and I posted it before, about the death spiral, the Arctic death spiral. And like every year for the, <clears throat> you know, since we've been burning fossil fuels, the uh, Arctic has gotten smaller and smaller. And that's, I just saw something recently, you know, like these real early expeditions. You know, where did they actually first come across the ice? Because there's probably more ice back then than there is now, for sure. But, like, I mean, how far did it extend in the 1700s? Well, there was that little ice age where Greenland turned green, and I don't know how much water disappeared from there at that time. I don't, you know, it didn't completely um, lose its ice, and the, the Arctic hasn't lost its ice for a long time either. But for some reason or other, we've, the, you know, if it gets too hot there, there's this methane, and that's the thing I haven't really been too sure about, whether there's more of it in the peat moss, or I think there's much more of it way down under the mantle of the ocean, that, or the planet Earth, actually, 
that, and it's frozen under there, so it won't turn into a gas. But, um, you know, if the Arctic ice melts, it's going to warm the water up, and then the methane's going to melt. And if one of these big burps of methane it comes up out of the earth, like a volcano kind of a thing, then, like, uh, it would make the climate uninhabitable. It would just, like, shoot up to 6% or 6 degrees above centigrade. And then everything would, the old ice would melt. And they had an article just today that the mayor of South Miami Beach was saying that he's, um, if they, you know, if one foot of water, <clears throat> if the water raises one foot, then it'll completely destroy the water table in the Miami area. And it would also make the sewers not work, so they'd all have to move out of there. And it could, we don't know how fast this could happen, but like I said, if that methane comes out of there, and the Arctic, the Arctic ice is floating there, so it doesn't make the oceans rise. It's, it's Greenland that we should be concerned about the most, because, um, but the Antarctic is melting. They, they just had a new study saying that this big ice shelf, they can tell it's been moving, and eventually it's going to slide out into there. And they say it's inevitable, so, you know, I mean, but they're not telling us the exact date, you know, and they've been wrong about these dates before. They didn't think that the Arctic would become uh, totally um, ice-free until... I think maybe the first person didn't think it would happen until 2100, and then they just keep downsizing the number of when the North Pole is going to be ice-free. And they, I think, well, the most recent people have said that it could be as early as 2015, and and it could even happen this year, because the amount right now is on a trajectory that's a little bit faster than the other years have been. And um, 2012 was pretty bad, and I think that was the worst year yet. About so anyway, like if this warms up the water and causes this permafrost, well, they're having huge fires right now up in the northern territories of Canada, and um, that's you know there's a lot of peat bogs up there, and the carbon dioxide is in these peat bogs. It's all that decaying stuff, and I guess it would get released. If, well, all the, and then all that burning is, is CO2 too. And, but that, you know, I don't think that's the real worry as much. Well, it is because those trees aren't going to be, it's not only producing CO2 in there, but it's getting rid of the carbon coming in from the photosynthesis. And so, like, this whole planet is just totally, like, burning up and, you know, the, the water in um, West Texas. They've got a bunch of cities that are going out of water there. And um, I got a story here that, you know, we're, we here in Arizona that depend on the Colorado River and Hoover Dam and all that. It's, uh, they're saying that, that these cities could face a cutback in water from the Colorado River. And um, right there it says a drought could bring, let's see, could bring reductions for Phoenix and Tucson by 2019, you know. And uh, this article, it doesn't mention, like, um, Las Vegas. You know, they're right there, right next to the lake. Lake Mead. Oh, yeah, here it is. It says, under an accord, 25-foot uh, drop in Lake Mead to 1025. Well, I don't know how low it has to be right now to um, deal with water to Las Vegas, but it's getting, it's at the lowest point it's ever been since like 1937 or when they started filling the lake up. And uh, I'm going to go by there pretty soon. I'm not going to be here in August to do a show because I'm going to be going on a little vacation to that Burning Man Festival. It's probably about the, I don't know, sixth time I've been. And I'll go to San Diego and maybe see my sister. Well, I'll see my sister somewhere too. Um, anyway, um so I've been watching the weather every day, like in New Delhi, in the in the weather reports to see whether they're going to get their monsoon rain. And um, 
They had like a quarter inch a few days ago, but um, their temperatures have been like 109 degrees Fahrenheit and and around that much every day, and they haven't had any rain except for that quarter inch a couple of days ago. So like um, all the weather, I mean, there's like so many crazy things happening. Like one guy, I should have put it up on my Facebook page, but he showed, he posted a video. It was like, I don't know, maybe about 20 little segments or more, little segments of catastrophes all over the United States. And they showed that flood. Maybe you saw that, that in Japan, there, you know, it was a wa- little waterfalls. And then all of a sudden, all these trees and, and bushes and everything just comes shooting out and gets the camera all wet. And so, um, you know, all over the world, you know, like they're having floods and do- torrential rains, and because it's all, you know, this little bit of warming, just even a little bit, will cause more moisture to go into the air. And you get tornadoes. They've had tornadoes up in Canada that they've never had before. And, um, you know, this isn't some biblical thing where, you know, you diverse things and wars and rumors of wars and everything like that. I mean, that's been going on all throughout history, and it's no big prophecy. It's just a fact of life that that we have these things. And so, like, um, you know, people that have been studying this for a long time, well, I mean, that's a long time, I would say, would be like 1968, or if you're, yeah, like when the Population Bomb book came out, well, Silent Spring, too. And uh, but I I never read that. It was something about oh DDT is killing the birds, so we wouldn't have any birds, and that would be the Silent Spring. That was like the first big environmentalist book, and I think it was just that one subject. But uh, Paul Ehrlich's population bomb. He he even talks about pollution. You know that's a consequence of this exponential growth rate that we have in um, in uh, with the world population. It just Goes up uh, like a like a uh, well. You see for yourself. What does that go up like? A spike. That's what it is. And uh, it just shoots up to nine billion in uh, 2032. And um, so um, you know it was below a billion people back in 1776. You know everything was just so quaint back then and even when my dad was born we had two billion people my dad was born long before that so you know it's like really changed you know like Colorado has really changed and and so has a lot of these other countries you know Mexico used to be like a real quaint lovely place to go on a you know adventure kind of a thing and you didn't have to worry about this drug wars and the Silanoa cartel, and they've had like all these young women murdered in in um, Juarez across from El Paso, and uh, I don't know if they they never really caught the person. They've got all these factories down there, Maquiladoras, where they're manufacturing things cheaper than American f- factories. You know, we ha- don't have hardly any factories here anymore. When I was growing up, it was kind of the beginning of the end. And um, they had, I worked in a factory in the Chicago area, <clears throat> and it was a, a union factory. It was uh, AFL-CIO, and, you know, the, it was a really bad union. The wages, it, well, they weren't living wages. And uh, I don't know, it, it was, I was still living with my parents, and and um, so you know, I, my mom said, you know, you either got to do some work or or go to school or get out of the house, you know, so I got a stupid night job at this factory making these pipe unions, and you pop them on the machine, and this oil goes all over, and it spins around and with machine tools and comes back out, and you you got a sleeve on to keep all the oil off, and you're all dirty. When you go home, you got to wash all this oil off. So I put made those things there, and it didn't pay very good, like I said. It was only like it was seven twenty-five an hour or something, or not even that, I don't think. But I remember when I worked on the railroad, they paid like seven dollars and ten cents, and that was 
that was pretty good. But um, back then, when I was doing that, like in uh, like 75, 1975 maybe, or yeah, maybe 78, that's when I did it. So anyway, we're running out of water. And uh, I one time spent the winter down in Yuma camping out on the Colorado River. <laughs> so anyway, what else do we got here? Oh yeah, let's see. Oh yeah, refugees in the world. They had a big pa article in the paper, New York Times, about about all these refugees and you know where are they all coming from. And I should find a ch chart about that or something because you know the United States created so many. There's a staggering 51 million people worldwide. Wow, that is a lot of people, you know. And why? Why are they kicked out of their houses? You know, I hear there's like really bad stuff going on in Thailand right now. You know, that I've been to Bangkok before and the people were really nice there. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a strange country. And um, so now they're really having a lot of problems. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to go there from, you know, the way things are going. I kind of like to see how the people I visited are doing over there. I don't really know. So what does it say here? In 2013, Afghans, Syrians, and Somalis accounted for more than half the total number of refugees. Wow. Hmm. Most refugees, and a lot of these Syrian refugees were um, displaced because of a drought. They had a, a really bad drought. You can Google, like, Syrian drought map, and you'll see that one area they have, like, severe drought, just like California is having a severe drought. And they didn't have much snow in the Sierra Mountains. I mean, this this is really serious, and uh, it's hard to tell where it's going to hit first. Some of these cities in uh, in West Texas, there I was telling you about, they're running out of water. And uh, what are they going to do? You know, it's like you know. I mean, we're all uh, where are we all going to go if, if we have to leave? We'll just. I mean, we could still live here in Arizona, but they'd really have to ration the water and, um, you know, it would probably just have to go up in price maybe. But, um, you know, there's just, you know, so many things that are happening and a lot of, and, and a few scientists and other people like myself have come to realize recently that, that we're really in a planetary emergency because of um, how warm it's getting and the possibility of having this methane come out of the um, Arctic area and causing the extinction. You know, you'd think maybe that, you know, the climate would be okay somewhere on the planet. You know, we could all move up to the North Pole or Canada or something, but, you know, not many people, you can't grow that much on, uh, on peat moss. You can't grow anything on that. And if they have a fluctuation like, you know, this polar vortex that's going to come down, it's not that serious of a one. I mean, it wouldn't be the cold that's going to kill the crops in the summer. It would be the heat. So, like, if they had a, an extreme heat that, like, you know, scorched the plants and killed them all, then, uh, well, anyway, that's kind of far-fetched, but... You know, it's basically like a lot of people are going to end up dying, you know. And um, that's all, you know, I used to think that the war the problem would be with running out of oil, you know, that's a, it's a finite resource. But then, then you have to look at the pollution for this oil. And <clears throat> probably, I don't know, like I was telling you earlier that I studied the history of uh, climate change. And I didn't bring that book with me, but I... But it explains how, you know, they figured that these um, gases that were spewing out, I mean, you, like, if you look at these chimneys, I don't know where they are, like like the chimneys on these uh, smelters here. One of my friends used to work up in the mines up in, I think, Morency or someplace when he was in, like, just got out of high school. And they, um, all this stuff, I don't know what was coming out of that chimney, but they told us that the cars would, you know, you'd have to get them painted every 
three years because of all the soot and stuff that comes out of these chimneys around these smelters. So, like, um, another problem is I was up in Superior, Arizona here, where I believe they must have had a smelter too because uh, one of the men there told me that it was so weird. I met this guy up there, and he I don't know where it was, but for some reason or other he started talking to me, and he was telling me that everybody that, you know, there's hardly anybody over a certain age there that's been there for a while, partly, I guess, also because the water is contaminated up in Superior, Arizona. They have to, like, truck it, like, from 50 miles away in a, in a pipe. They pipe it, like, 50 miles away. So I don't know what, what how, how, you know, the, that's what they did there. And uh, people don't live very long there. And um, so, you know, they started discovering that, yeah, we can't start putting all this stuff in the, in the uh, atmosphere, but you can't really stop doing it either. You know, it's like, unless we come up with a whole completely different lifestyle, you know, we've got all these cars, and we, we generate all this electricity, and make all this cement stuff, you know, which is, is a big pollutant. And plus, we have all these cows that produce a lot of methane, and you have to grow all that corn to feed them with, and like I was saying earlier, I saw this thing on Access here, Access Tucson cable TV show last night. They had, a, I think it was a, it was an old KUAT video. And I, like I said earlier, I think Access Tucson is teaming up with the um, uh, U of A here, the University of Arizona, to because we're ro really low on funds. They're going to start changing our schedules here. And so, like in August, but I won't be here in August. Uh, but uh, so my next show won't be. I won't have a show in September. They're going to cut that out. Uh, so my next show will be in October. This will be my last show until October, unless maybe I can sneak into the studio when there's a gap and make a tape or something. But uh, anyway, so things are changing here, and. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a hard thing to realize that, you know, I mean, we're supposed to be so smart and science can save us and there must be a solution to this problem. You know, we've, we'll just have to have a Manhattan Project or or um, whatever they do to, to to get things done like they have in the past uh, to, the, to, to solve this problem. You know, we'll just throw some money at it, you know, the free market system and all that stuff and try to stop this global warming. But um, I, it's, it's kind of locked in there. It's there, you know, and it's just not going to vanish, especially if we don't have any trees. I think what we should do, and that would be a good idea. You know, we just stop all this stupid industry right now. You know, we shut down all these McDonald's restaurants and, and all these factories and start making standardized parts uh, tiny little electric cars, you know, and and getting rid of these suburbs, and you know, anyway, we you know, build a, a different kind of a city layout and all that stuff, and you know, everybody doesn't have to be so. Um, you know, I don't know if this is. You know, it could be too late, but we could at least try. I mean, you know, we're working at these bogus jobs that don't really produce anything, and that or else it's like um, bad for you, like tobacco or or um, or some of this food, you know, whip, I don't know, it's like um, all sugary sodas and stuff like that. And um, so like, you know, there's so many people that aren't really like these accountants, and or not accountants, well, and uh, people on Wall Street and that are making all this money on the stock market, you know, those are the kind of people that, that Jesus Christ upset the tables of the money changers, you know, the mythology of Jesus, this Messiah, you know, and it's, it's, it's right, it's, it's true, you know, I always, I like the Gospels, uh, but I don't like St. Paul, I think Paul was a deceiver, he um, wasn't logical, and, uh, and there's like this other word that they don't really translate correctly, is, is in the beginning was the Logos, and logos is like logic and and reasoning, and um, it's rarely the word. 
and there's the you know, etymology of the word logic. So the you know Saint Paul wasn't logical. You know this confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead isn't going to save you. And, but Jesus was a radical and a revolutionary. You know he told his disciples to go forth without money in their purses and to um, to um, don't um, you can't serve God or money. You'll either love the one or hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other. And then the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed. And that's in Luke. And, um, you know, the, these people, that's the whole problem with the Christian religion is, um, you know, this fantasy that confessing with your mouth is going to save you. I kind of wonder, you know, they're having this big Jehovah's Witness um, festival here. And I think at the, tonight is their first night. It's This is Friday, September 11th. You know, I should be doing a September 11th show you know, about this uh, World Trade Center buildings. It's like, you know, that's an explosion, man, you know. there It was like totally uh, pulverized, and, and there was this inches and inches of dust all over lower Manhattan, and nothing on ground zero except these heavy steel girders. There was like no desks or telephones or or any of that stuff. It just pulverized that and created a pyroclastic cloud. It's like, you know, a building with an office fire. It doesn't completely destroy it, you know. The the high-rise buildings are designed to withstand fires. You know, they put firewalls in there and they they, um, put, maybe they put asbestos and stuff like that on the on the girder so that they don't um, melt, but uh, I mean it doesn't melt, though. it doesn't get hot enough to melt steel, because there's a steel building, it didn't melt, and they designed them, like I'm saying, you know, so that, you know, they had a, a plane crash in there, but the main girders that hold the building up are in the middle, it's not around the edge, so when that plane went in there, you could see it went in on the side even, it didn't go straight in the middle and uh, and destroy the center or steel girders, you know, it just destroyed the outer ones that don't really hold it together. So anyway, that yeah, I never believed that that whole building would just, it just comes straight down, just like a controlled demolition. And on my website I have a video in, in China where they destroyed a high-rise building and it happened exactly the same way that they destroyed the World Trade Center. And it just came straight down, you know, and a lot of the firemen that were there, the first responders, heard this boom, 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 just like uh, controlled demolition, those guys were saying. And so they don't, you know, I mean, they don't want to tell you this on the TV because it's going to make you, like, mad or it's going to make you feel disillusioned. You know, we supposedly have a democracy here and our vote counts and, you know, and Bill Clinton was so cute and, and this and that and Hillary, oh gosh, I mean... It's such a stupid circus. This George Bush Sr. was head of the CIA, and um, Gerald Ford was on um, the Warren Commission, and Ronald Reagan was on the Rockefeller Commission, and Ronald, the big actor, you know, with the smooth, silvery voice. I mean, you know, these people like Alan Greenspan that think we can just, um, you know, laissez-faire and, and, you know, the corporations are good and they're not going to cheat and steal and and rob everything like some of these people do you know i met this man who's suing uh somebody that that i know and i'm suing him too actually in a way and um you know they had this fraud and he was saying that that there's so much fraud you know the fbi can't get involved in this and but they he thinks they will be more interested in it if he wins his case against him you know it's like he was saying if the FBI was going to go after people like this, they'd have to increase their staff 20%. And this guy lives in Washington, D.C. Maybe he knows, you know, he's a lawyer too, and an employment lawyer. So maybe he knows that um, there's um, some kind of a problem, you know, with things in the world that they're not telling us about, like... Uh, you know, they don't want to create hysteria, and that's why they did this Warren Commission report. Earl Warren was uh, 
a mason, I think. And uh, let me see what I tell you he is. And um, he, um, where is that? And I was telling you earlier about, um, well, they had Lyman Lemnitzer on the uh, Rockefeller Commission. And uh, that was to cover up this Kennedy assassination. And he was a 33-degree mason. And he, he was the one who did that Operation Northwoods thing. So um, anyway, you know, Kennedy was the first real coup d'etat in America. You know, the CIA was good at coup d'etats in, all over the world. And I, I wrote that on there the, throughout the world. So why not Dallas? But what else was I looking for here? I was trying to find out. Oh, Warren, Warren yeah. No, he was the vice president running mate of Dewey in 1948. That's all I have on him. You know, I had to do a little short uh, little summary of some of these people. The rats investigated the mice. And by that, you know, they, they had like the head of the the CIA looking at some of this stuff. That guy, C. Douglas, no, not C. Alan Dulles, uh, the OSS and all that stuff. You know, they were just so corrupt and crooked. Nixon, Nixon knew a lot about this uh, Kennedy assassination, and they had these Watergate tapes. And they, E. Howard Hunt, I was showing you these pictures. There's E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis were these tramps who were arrested. They were dressed up like tramps. You know, Howard Hunt was an expert at disguises. And you can see there's one of the tramps, and there's pictures of Howard Hunt. And there's the tramp, another one. There was three of them. And I'm not too sure about the third one. There was speculation on it. You know, when I first read this book, it was like, oh, maybe 1980 or so. And, um, and well, no, yeah, maybe it was. I don't remember. But, no, it was before Ronald Reagan was uh, president or after. So, anyway, they, um, E. Howard Hunt was one of the Watergate burglars. And they... Um, got his pictures and and people realized that um, he uh, was involved in this Kennedy assassination. And Nixon, you know, that was the under Nixon. And so Nixon knew about this uh, Kennedy assassination. And in fact, he was in Dallas the day before, allegedly on a visit to the Pepsi-Cola bottling company president, um, it's like Don Kendall, he went to go see him. In fact, I think I've got a picture of him on, on here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, Nixon with, um, uh, Don, what is his name? Uh, what the heck does it say there? Uh, Don Kendall, yeah. And, and this was in the Dallas Morning, Dallas Times Herald on the 11th, you know, it was a Warren Commission exhibit, number 1975. And the, the Nation magazine had a pretty good thing about uh, where was George Bush Sr. when Kennedy was killed. They had a really good thing now. This was in the Nation, July and August 1988. And so I put this all down in uh, my little campaign brochure here. Let's go down to the end here for you. And there it is. And then we also have this crazy uh, single bullet, which um, the magic bullet, because you know it's just a big conspiracy. This guy Oswald was a patsy. He even said he was a patsy, and they set him up. And uh, and the real assassins were hiding behind the grassy knoll. And there was probably another one. You, know, you triangulate for some reason or other, and. And, you know, you can see the head snap back. So that was like the first conspiracy I think I read. Or maybe, yeah, I think, no, wait a minute. I'm trying to think. The first conspiracy I came across was this um, Cambodian thing. Because I realized that Pol Pot believed in eliminating money. And uh, so I was reading a book by Noam Chomsky called After the Cataclysm about the um, Cambodian genocide, these alleged killing fields they had there. And some, some journalists went and interviewed a lot of people there, and a lot, some of them were saying that, that 
these atrocity reports by the Khmer Rouge weren't really um, as bad. It was a civil war, you know, and so um, they, they, Pol Pot believed in eliminating money, and that's what I was interested in. And I've got this book, The Gospel of Eliminating Money. So, like, they demonize and slander people who believed in eliminating money. You know, I was telling you earlier that Jesus Christ believed in eliminating money. And um, so a lot of famous people believed in eliminating money. But, uh, you know, Karl Marx did. And they don't really want to tell you about it, but, um, you know, and then they, um, Fidel Castro and Nikolai Tolstoy and um, D.H. Lawrence had stuff to say about money. Shakespeare had a lot to say about money. And St. Thomas More's uh, Utopia, they didn't have any money. And then the Essenes, who were contemporaries of Jesus, did not touch money. And Plato's Republic, they didn't touch gold and silver. So, like, if you eliminate money, it would get rid of a lot of these unnecessary jobs and all these harmful ones or, and unproductive ones like bankers and bookkeepers and accountants and salesmen. So another thing we need to do would be to get rid of these international boundary lines. You know, I mean, we're all on this planet, you know, and people shouldn't suffer, you know, and we've got to come to terms with nature, not come to terms with nature, but like um, get in tune and in harmony with nature, you know. It's like they had this video when I was growing up or not too long ago called um, Kwanastatsi, and it's an Indian word um, for out of balance or maybe even life out of balance. And so, like, you know, this factory farming we have is the worst. You know, the way they raise pigs, they show this big sow, this female pig with, like, I'm, it looked like at least... 20 piglets like they were all sucking on her you know and she was like huge fat pig and she was laying on her side and she had some kind of uh, um, grease on her back so that her skin wouldn't get all rubbed out rubbing against this pole back there and then they moved on to this chickens and uh, like this house and this chicken room and they had this it looked like a street sweeper and these arms with little fingers they'd go like this or like that and then the chickens would get hit with these fingers and be forced inside this like like sweet street sweeper <laughs> and then they would go in there and uh, they might they they'd go out on a conveyor belt and these little chickens would be put into these drawers this conveyor belt made the chickens go right into these drawers they would like fly up against the damp the side and fall down and then the guy would close the drawer and from there they probably drowned him or something you know that would be the most practical way to have a mass extermination or like you know if Hitler was going to kill people he would have done it in a way like that instead of using dangerous or inert chemicals like diesel exhaust or um, cyanide you know hydrogen cyanide it wouldn't be a very practical way to have to exterminate people. You know, like if, um, you know, maybe when things get really bad, you know, uh, when climate change really starts to get bad and uh, there's no food around, you know, there might be like mercy killings and they'll fill the whole gymnasium up with people and, and then they would um, uh, do them away like that. Or maybe they would have a bunch of phenobarbital or something and they would be like shamans, you know. But it, it'll happen, you know. I mean, where, would you want to die through starvation or, or you know, like in a gas chamber? Be, you know, I don't know. You know, it would be the most humane way, I guess, with phenobarbital, you know. Uh, they used to sell it down in uh, Nogales at the vet, you know, the vet supply stores because they would use it to kill sick animals with. Uh, a lot of people in the Hemlock Society would recommend that you go down and use that stuff. And I was, one of my neighbors tried to commit suicide, but he failed because he um, had some other kind of medicine that he took at the same time, which kept his heart going, you know. And so he um, ended up surviving, and, you know, they threw him in the nut house because he was suicidal. And then he went to live with near his sister, 
and he had like a degenerative disease. That was so slowly going to force him to lay in bed. I think his mother died a horrible death of this disease, and I can't remember the name of it. It was something to go with an A. Uh, it, wasn't, it was like Lou Gehrig's disease, I think. I don't know. And um, it wasn't Alzheimer's. But anyway, so um, after that, um, well, a lot of people don't realize also, you know, that building came down straight, but and there was nothing left but <clears throat> in um, girders and and powder, you know, all over Manhattan, the big World Trade Center building. And I was telling you about that was just pulverized, and and everything was like. But this one, building number seven, came straight down to that day, and it wasn't it wasn't hit by an airplane. Very few people realize this. You know, it sounds so crazy that uh, a building would come straight down like that. It only had a small fire in there. And I'm thinking maybe, you know, they shot that third plane down. You know, wouldn't it have been great fireworks if they would have had three buildings come into New York, one hit, you know, building the big, you know, South Tower and the North Tower, and then the third plane came in and got building number seven. Well, somehow or other, that plane crashed. And I think maybe... I don't know, I heard it was shot down. Maybe there was a rogue pilot who scrambled his plane, and, um, you know, they don't want to tell you that for some reason or other, and they just say that those people in the plane overtook the, you know, made it sound heroic and everything. But um, that third plane was probably going to crash into the World Trade Center building number seven. You know, the one that crashed into the Pentagon, they're saying that there was, like, records, you know, the financial audit of the Pentagon was in there. And I can't tell, like some people say, and there's this quote from Donald Rumsfeld allegedly saying, or he is saying, and I, I don't quite remember the whole story about this, you know, if it was him miss saying something, but, you know, how much money has the Pentagon lost, or if they were being audited, and then this plane crashed right where they were doing that, and and then another thing is they had they just had that side reinforced. You can see that there were workers out there, and they had a big spool of um, electrical wire. And if this plane actually came in like they said it did, it would have left divots in the grass. You know, it's like almost an impossible thing to get a huge airplane in a building like that. You know, you're coming down way way far away, and you can see the building down there, and you gotta move this thing just right and you got you can't come down too sharp you got to come down like that you know and just go straight into the building but um they don't have any like skid marks on the ground and um then they some of these poles got knocked down but the weird part about it is you don't really see any evidence you know of this built of this airplane somebody apparently threw out some stuff some metal you know, to, they set the scene up. It's like that, the, where the plane crashed, allegedly crashed in, uh, if it wasn't shot down, it, you know, it supposedly crashed in Pennsylvania, and there's a crater there. They show it, you know, but you don't see any plane parts. You don't see any seats, you know, no luggage or anything, you know. So that plane was really shot down. And so, like, they had, you know, since they had this World Trade Center building already rigged to explode, they have a a video of this guy Silverstein who owned the building, and they have him say, "Okay, let's pull it." You know, and pull it is a term for you know destroying the building and uh, bringing it down. And it came straight down, just like a controlled demolition. Same with you know the World Trade Center. It was a new kind you know of destroying a high-rise building. You know, how how do you think you're going to do that? You think you're going to just take it apart? You know, no. They they had this sophisticated bombing in there. And, you know, they've got new bombs now that size of suitcases and stuff, and they could just easily run it up one of the escal uh, elevators, you know, plant it near those girders that are in the middle of the, the building. And we have only got like half a minute left, and uh, I won't be back until October unless I can get a shot in September sometime. Maybe I can make a, a tape. But anyway, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind on your hand, and they don't translate that correctly, 
It's not an RFD chip or anything. Oh, so anyway, bye.